Good morning. Uh, here is a series on thermodynamics. I'm going to make uh, multiple videos on different uh, sections in thermodynamics. So in this first section, we are going to discuss specific heat of gases. Now we know that uh, specific heat is defined as the quantity of heat required to increase the temperature of one kilogram of a substance through one Kelvin. So it's the heat required for one kilogram to change the temperature by one Kelvin. But when we come to gases, instead of defining it for one kilogram, we will define it for one mole of a gas. So therefore, this is called the molar specific heat. And again, gases can be heated under two conditions. We can keep the volume constant. That means the gas is not allowed to expand, which means the pressure will increase. Or we can keep the pressure constant. That means the gas is allowed to expand, so the volume increases. So, in short, we can either keep the pressure constant or the volume constant when we heat a gas. Therefore, gases have two specific heats. One is the specific heat at constant pressure. The other is the specific heat at constant volume. And when a gas is heated under constant pressure, since we are allowing it to expand, a part of the heat that is given is used for expansion. Or in other words, work is done. So a part of the energy that is supplied is used for expansion. That means the specific heat at constant pressure is always going to be bigger than the specific heat at constant volume. Because when you keep the volume constant, all the heat that we supply is only used to increase the temperature or the internal energy. So again, specific heat at constant pressure is greater than the specific heat at constant volume. So molar specific heat of gases that is defined for one mole with respect to one mole. And then there are two specific heats for any gas, Cp and Cv, where in one case volume is kept constant, the other pressure is kept constant. And number three, if volume is kept constant, then the pressure changes and no work is done because the gas is not expanding. And therefore, the formula for quantity of heat supplied is N times C sub V times DT, where N is the number of moles of the gas, CV is the specific heat at constant volume, and DT is the change in temperature. So that's the formula that we use to calculate the quantity of heat required to heat a gas. Next, let's look at the law of equipartition of energy. This is a law by Boltzmann, and according to this law, the energy for each degree of freedom and for each molecule is one half kBT. So the energy of one molecule per degree of freedom is one half kBT where Kb is Boltzmann's constant and T is the temperature in Kelvin. Boltzmann constant is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joule per Kelvin. 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joule per Kelvin. Now, since we have defined the energy of one molecule, we can easily define the energy of one mole because we know that there is the Avogadro number of molecules in one mole. So the energy per degree of freedom per mole is one half Kb times Na times T, 
which is one half RT because Boltzmann constant is the ratio of the universal gas constant to the Avogadro number. So we see that, uh, you know, because we have KB there, uh, you can substitute for KB as R by NA. The NAs will get canceled and that is one half RT. So that's, what's that? That's the energy of one degree of freedom for one mole. So now we need to talk about the degrees of freedom. An ideal gas is considered to be a monoatomic gas. An ideal gas is a monoatomic gas. And a monoatomic gas has three degrees of translational freedom because it can vibrate, move along the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. So a monoatomic molecule or a monoatomic gas, that is an ideal gas, has three degrees of translational freedom. Translational means motion along the three axes. And therefore, for a monoatomic gas, the total energy can be obtained by multiplying this expression with three, because this is the energy per degree of freedom, and the ideal gas has three degrees of freedom. So just multiply this with three, and we will get the formula for the total energy, total translational kinetic energy of an ideal gas. That is the total translational kinetic energy of an ideal gas per molecule is 3 by 2 kBT, but per mole it's 3 by 2 RT. So if you're given the absolute temperature of the gas, we can easily calculate the total translational kinetic energy. So here is an example. What is the average translational kinetic energy? It says, you know, average because the molecules don't have exactly the same kinetic energy. So whenever we talk about uh, large numbers of molecules or any entities, we always go to the average. So what is the average translational kinetic energy of an ideal gas at 700 Kelvin? Translational kinetic energy per molecule is 3 by 2 kBT. So KB is uh, Boltzmann's constant, which is 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23. Multiplied with 700, it's already in Kelvin, and you get the answer as 1.45 times 10 to the negative 20 joules. What if the question was about the translational kinetic energy of one mole? Then what you got to do is use 3 by 2 RT or multiply this with the Avogadro number. That should make sense. So in that case, we get 8,730 joules. That's a lot of energy in one mole of a gas. And when we come to heat engines, this is the energy that we are trying to tap. This is the energy that we're trying to use in a heat engine and to convert it into mechanical energy which will now help us to move from one place to another as the gas expands. We'll get to that in one of the sections. All right, so let's move on to the next topic. What about if it's a diatomic gas? A diatomic gas has five degrees of freedom, three translational as before, and two rotational. We know that the diatomic molecule has a bond axis and it can rotate about two perpendicular axes to the bond axis. So it can rotate about this axis, which is the Y, or it can rotate about the Z axis. So just like that, or, you know, it can rotate like that. Two rotations. It can also rotate about the bond axis which would be the x-axis, so it'll be rotating like that. But the rotational inertia in this case is really small, and so it's neglected. That's why we only have two degrees of rotational freedom. So three translational degrees, where it can move along the x, the y, or the z, 
combined with two rotational degrees of freedom, give us five degrees of freedom for a diatomic gas. Five degrees of freedom. Therefore, the energy per molecule would be 5 by 2 kBT. But when we get to triatomic molecules or polyatomic molecules, uh, where you have more than three, like carbon dioxide, methane, and all that, so you would get six degrees of freedom, three translational and three rotational, which gives six degrees of freedom. Therefore, the energy per molecule is six by two kBT, which is three kBT. Remember that each one of these formulas is written for one molecule. So if you want to calculate the energy per mole, we got to multiply this with the Avogadro number. So keep that in mind. All right, moving to the next topic. Consider that there is a piston fitted with a smooth frictionless, I should have said, consider that there is a cylinder fitted with a smooth frictionless piston. And this is the initial uh, position of the piston. And there is one mole of a gas in here and it's heated. When the gas is heated, because the piston is free to move, it expands and comes out to a new position here. That means the volume changes. So a part of the heat is used to increase the internal energy of the gas, while another part is used to do work for expansion. Now in this particular case, the pressure is kept a constant. So this is heating under constant pressure. The volume changes. Therefore, at constant, we know that if the pressure is constant, as in this case, the total heat given is used for two things. One part is used to increase the internal energy and the other part is used to do work for expansion. But Q is by definition CP times DT. Remember we're talking about one mole of a gas and therefore a Q is actually N CP DT but N is one so it's only CP DT. So on the left hand side Q is CP DT on the right hand side change in internal energy is CV DT. Again N is one mole remember that plus work. Now work is pressure times change in volume. How do we get that? We know work is force times displacement, but force is pressure times area. We're talking about the area of the piston. So the area of the piston which moves out, so we get force as pressure times area, but A times dx is dv. Uh, that is the area. And so when we substitute we get CP DT is equal to CV DT plus pressure times change in volume, PDV. But since we are dealing with one mole of a gas, we can apply the ideal gas equation, which is PV is equal to NRT, again, N is one, so PV is RT. And then when you differentiate, you get PDV on the left side because pressure is constant, remember? PDV is equal to, on the right side, R is a constant, so we will get RDT. Therefore, we can substitute for PDV as RDT, and then the DTs will cancel out, and so we get CP is equal to CV plus R. This is called Mayer's relation, M-A-Y-E-R-S, so Mayer's relation. That means if we know the specific heat at constant volume for any gas, we can simply add the universal gas constant and find the specific heat at constant pressure. Remember the universal gas constant R is 8.314 joule per Kelvin per mole. All right, so the ratio of specific heats CP by CV is an important quantity and the symbol used is gamma. CP by CV is gamma. Remember CP is always greater than CV so gamma is always greater than 1 
For a monoatomic gas, gamma is 1.67. So for gases like helium, neon, you know, argon and all that, it's 1.67. For diatomic gases like oxygen, nitrogen and so on, hydrogen, it's uh, 1.4. And for polyatomic gases like carbon dioxide, a methane and all that, we get 1.33. Now the question arises, what about air? Air is a mixture of many gases, but most of it is nitrogen, so it's diatomic. And therefore, when there is a problem with respect to air, you've got to take gamma as 1.4, because most of the gases in air, nitrogen and oxygen, are diatomic. So that's about the ratio of specific heats. So now, at constant volume, we know that Q is the change in internal energy. So when you heat a gas at constant volume, all the heat that is given is used only for increasing the internal energy. I've said that uh, many times, but so important, I'm saying it again, because there's no expansion. All of the heat is used to increase the internal energy. And we know that the internal energy is three by two nRT. Internal energy is three by two nRT for n moles of a gas, where T is the absolute temperature. Therefore, if you change, if you take the change in internal energy, you're gonna get three by two nR delta T, because the others are constants. Change in internal energy is three by two nR delta T. So now we can substitute it back into this relation, which gives Q is 3 by 2 nR delta T, which is NCV delta T, right? We remember that generally Q is N times CV delta T. So put these two equal to each other, and then we will get a very important relation. So. NCV delta T is 3 by 2 NR delta T, and which gives CV is equal to 3 by 2 R. So CV is 3 by 2 R. This is uh, for a monoatomic gas, for an ideal gas, which is monoatomic. If it's diatomic, it's going to be 5 by 2 R. And if it's triatomic, it's going to be 6 by 2 R because of the degrees of freedom. So in this section, we have talked about the specific heats of gases, and we have looked at how to apply the law of equipartition of energy to the gases. So this is the end of section one. We'll see you in section two.